about to say. <laughs> As for doubt, I can honestly say that when I was a Christian, I don't ever remember doubting the existence of God or the truth of Christianity. Not even for a moment, not even once. <clears throat> and at age 43 as an atheist, I look back and I think, I'm kind of embarrassed and humiliated that I never did. You know, you seems like a lot of Christians at least have a moment of doubt or even when I talk to people that I used to be good friends with that are Christians, some of them said that they've struggled with doubt. And I honestly never did. I don't think I had any doubt until probably just before I realized I didn't believe. And I was never the type that something bad happened to me and I'm hurting or angry or disappointed and then I blame God because <clears throat> my understanding was that God is a good God and you can look at the book of Job or just many of the Bible characters and they went through a lot of junk and that's the way life is especially if you wrestle with the book of Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> yeah, I never blamed God. I never got I, I never felt anger at God. When I was a Christian I didn't. And as an atheist I never had any feelings towards God because I didn't I don't believe he exists. So how am I gonna have feelings towards that, that what I always say is that that'd be like the me being mad at Megatron because Optimus Prime was killed by him. Optimus, or, um, God is a, depending on the context in the Bible, sometimes he's a very admirable character. Sometimes he's a very fearful character. He can be the villain and he can be the hero. He, um, the many faces of God, contradictory faces of God in the Bible. Uh, hold on. There was one aspect of dispensational eschatology. Okay, first of all, dispensation means, well, what it amounted to was a, a certain period of history, and there were an ordered series of periods. And in each period, God had a relationship with his people, be it Adam and Eve, Noah, um, Israel, and the church. Come on. That's my dog, sorry. Um, and eschatology means the doctrine of last things, meaning what happens in the future, what happens after you die, what happens at the end of the world. Anything to do with the end conclusion of the salvific history between God and humanity. So anyhow, um, part of dispensational eschatology was that there was something that they called that the prophets had a telescopic view of history. And what the illustration they showed was a prophet standing on a mountaintop with a telescope looking ahead toward the uh, future that God has, was showing the prophet. And sometimes you'd see one, two, three, four mountaintops in between the prophet and the end result of what he, would, he or she was seeing. And they would compare different prophecies from different prophets and prophetesses. And sometimes you would see an immediate uh, conclusion of what God was showing. And sometimes they would see, for instance, the book of Revelation, would, the author would see the final end. And sometimes you'd see points in the middle, like the Babylonian exile or the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70 CE. But it, a lot of times it wouldn't be, or actually never was it all like, here's the view, here's the overarching view of history in order, and here's what it means. It was never like that. So they would take different pieces of the Bible and blend them together to try and make coherent sense of the prophecies to fit their view of what the future 
is, according to their view of the Bible. So they call it a telescopic view. So you might start a sentence saying, ah, I'm walking right now and I can't think of an example. Or the great and terrible day of the Lord is at hand. The great, that those two words are the beginning part of the prophecy. And terrible is the second part. <laughs> and they might say, and I don't remember if this was a, if this is actually what it was, but they might say the great part of it is that the rapture happens. The day of the Lord is here. It's great. The rapture happens. And then later in life, when I was part of the revival movement, it was like there's going to be this great move of God and outpouring of His Spirit and all flesh, fulfilling of Joel chapter 2 prophecy. I think it was chapter 2. So that's the great part of it. The terrible part is after the rapture, or after that, depending on how you viewed the rapture, when it was supposed to happen, there would be the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan. So there'd be all kinds of calamities and cataclysms and tragedies and suffering and the majority of the population of Earth wouldn't survive through this period of time, which I was taught was going to be seven years exactly, which I later understood to be symbolic, so it didn't mean literally seven years necessarily. But anyways, so it got me to think, I just had a really jacked up way of thinking for a long time, and it was really hard to break out of it that I was the only one that thought that way, that the last thing that you said was the subject of what we're talking about. Even if it's 10 minutes go by and we're driving in a car, it was very sequential, everything was. And then, or how God's word cannot be broken. So I'm just rambling right now. Another thing I remember is Revelation 21.8. It says that, well, I'm paraphrasing it. If you're a sinner, you have a place reserved for you in the lake of fire for all of eternity. So eternal conscious torment in flames forever. And it says all liars, all, I think it says fornicators, the dogs, which some interpret to mean the homosexuals or guys that rent gay prostitutes so they can bang them in the rear end <laughs> whatever it meant anyways the thing it said all liars and that one is what really really shook me because it said all liars have a place in the lake of fire so i thought i better not ever ever lie or i'm going to the lake of fire and i still remember being seven or eight years old and I had my bicycle and I went to my friend Travis's house and he lived two blocks away down a block over so no one could see me when I was on his street my parents couldn't my neighbors couldn't and he was a year older than me and there was one or two other kids that were also that age and they would ride their bikes down the street and kind of race down the hill and it wasn't a busy street it was a side street <laughs> and they would uh they oh yeah they were tempting me you know come on let's race and i was like well i i'm not allowed to ride in the street unless i'm crossing the street and they were like who gives a care i was like well god does <laughs> i would literally say that and they're like dude just come on and i remember giving in and doing it and they didn't think anything of it. We were just kids having fun. But for me, it was like, oh my God, I just sinned against the Lord and I lied, which qualifies me for the lake of fire. And I remember at dinner that evening with my parents and sister at the table and um, my mom asked me, I don't remember exactly what. I don't remember if she said, did you ride your bike in the street? Or something, but she asked me something, and I hold on, lied right to her face. And that I've probably lied countless times before that, but for some reason I didn't think that I did. And but this time I was well aware 
that I was lying. And I was breaking another commandment, dishonoring my mother and father. And yeah, so at that point, I thought until, and I wasn't going to admit it to her. And I didn't. And of course, probably a year or two later, she gave in to my pressure and finally said, it's okay if I ride in the street as long as I'm very careful. Being an overprotective mother, I get it. But I think that's the first time I started really thinking, you know, there's a growing chance that I'm going to end up in hell. And if the rapture were to happen right now, I don't know if I would be taken away. And if you saw the 1970s movies about the, the number of the beast, where people's heads got chopped off at church because they missed the rapture and had turned to Christ after that and wouldn't take the mark of the beast... Yeah, that put the fear of Almighty God into me. And so I lived my life in the shadow of the trumpet could sound at any moment and the rapture could happen. And I don't know if I'm going because I lie all the time. And I mean, I wasn't like a pathological liar like my, one of my close friends was as a kid. <laughs> but I lied to cover my ass. <laughs> And as a kid, I would exaggerate things, not even realizing I'm doing that. And then I started thinking, you know what, that, that, that makes it a lie if I'm exaggerating that. Or I would deny things because I felt embarrassed. You know, I was just a kid trying to be cool and fit in. So, yeah, doubt I honestly did not ever experience doubt. Even when I read all the books about dinosaurs and evolution at the age of 8, 9, and 10, I just thought, well, in my modern adult language, I could tell you that I thought it that evolution was just describing the anatomical similarities between animals and that it didn't mean that they actually evolved. But when they talk about this thing evolved from this thing, and this species is related to the others in this way, and I'd read that, I'd kind of just skim read through that because I thought, yeah, that's just a bunch of satanic lies that these scientists don't know any better. And really, God created everything and the way it is. And what they're saying about evolution is just they're observing the similarities. And then thinking that means that we're related. Just like I'm re I look like my parents. And I'm from them. Well, if uh, one animal looks similar to another, then they're assuming that it evolved from that, but it really didn't. Well, that didn't bother me, no. What did bother me was... <coughs> Actually, I just lost my train of thought. But yeah, I didn't have any doubts. And I had my spiritual experiences that, in my mind, confirmed my faith. I, to me, it wasn't even really faith. I thought it was knowledge. And my mom had spiritual experiences. My uncle, my grandmother, my grandfather, my great-grandmother. And I heard all these stories, their experiences. And to me, that was my whole world. It was like my family were prone to have experiences, it seemed like. Kind of like Native Americans. It runs in the family to be a seer and a prophet. But it doesn't. Well, maybe something does. I don't know. But I think it's because we were ignorant, poorly educated, charismatic Pentecostals. And when we read the Bible and it said Jesus did miracles and healing the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons, and other things were the norm. Well, it, it seemed like it to me as a kid. I hear all the stories about all these miraculous events. It's not like we studied Ecclesiastes in the book of Proverbs and hermeneutics or anything. We learned all the stories that kids are taught. So I thought this was normal. And I had some dramatic experiences that I thought were completely believable to anybody I would tell and I thought I my interpretation of these things was 
obviously correct. And that's the story for another video. Those are stories for other videos, but come on. The Bible says, preach the gospel to all creation. Many has not yet heard the gospel, so maybe if I give an evangelist some money, many can be saved too. She can hear the gospel. But yeah, those are my thoughts for today. I don't know how to make a video. I just decided to shoot one while I'm walking the dog.